Our subject this evening is the Word of God and the Way of Man. The Word of God and the Way of Man. And we're turning tonight to the first chapter in the little prophecy of Haggai and reading some verses there. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm, and he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it in a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain, bring wood, and build the house, and I'll take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Ye looked for much, and lo, it came to little, and when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house? Therefore the heaven over you are stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I call for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, upon the corn, upon the new wine, upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon man, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hand. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. I break off our reading there at the thirteenth verse of this first chapter of Haggai. The Word of God and the Way of Man. The alarm clock will never become the most treasured possession of the average citizen of this country. It's an institution in our contemporary society, but that will never be put in a museum as one of the cherished objects of our life. An alarm clock will never win a loving cup or a popularity contest. We never like to be waked up out of a sound and restful sleep. And the culprit that does wake us up is not going to be popular. In fact, he's a criminal. He should be punished and not rewarded. They're now trying to make alarm clocks with different kinds of pleasant sounds, even soft music and hunted words to wake you up in the morning in a very nice, sweet sort of manner. But it reminds us of the old bromide that a rose by any other name will smell just as sweet. Well, an alarm clock with any other sound is still an alarm clock. Even today, some large corporations funnel in periodically during working days soft and pleasing music. They find that better than to use the lash of the taskmaster or the whip of a Simon Legree to make employees productive. When people are comfortable and satisfied, they do not want to hear a disturbing voice or a displeasing sound. 
Today, America is prosperous and powerful. Today, we are comfortable and confident. Today, we are satisfied and satiated as a nation, and it's doubtful whether we are very grateful today. It's one thing, sure, woe to anyone who disturbs us, who sounds an alarm, who blows a whistle, or turns on the siren. In one community in the Middle West, a church was restrained that built a very lovely plant in a new area, was restrained from putting up chimes because the neighborhood protested. They said they lived far out from the city. They had to commute, and all week long they were up early and out late, and Sunday morning they wanted to sleep in. And they didn't even want church chimes to wake them up, and certainly not to rebuke them that they were not going to the Lord's house. And they won, and the church was forbidden even to put up chimes to wake up people on Sunday morning and call them to the Lord's house. If Paul Revere rode again in America, he'd be arrested for disturbing the peace. John the Baptist would lose his head, not for rebuking a king's sinful life, but for being a rabble-rouser and a calamity howler. And this is the reason that God's prophet never did win a popularity contest. The prophets were stoned, not starred. They were rejected, never received. They were accursed, never acclaimed. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, who rebuked his own generation, was crucified on a cross because sinful men hated him. Now, Haggai occupied a particularly difficult position and I know of no prophet that was on a rougher spot than he was. He was the first prophet after the Babylonian captivity to speak to these returning captives to the land. These people had been through 70 years of slavery. They were numbed and hardened as a criminal was that had been in prison and had come out. They were not willing even now to listen to the voice of God. They wanted to dwell safely, each man under his vine and his fig tree. And it was the business of this man, Haggai, was to wake up the nation to its relationship to God and its responsibility to rebuild God's temple. He was the alarm clock, and he was not a very popular one. You may be sure of that. And you find Haggai, he rebukes, he exhorts, he cajoles, he encourages, he uses all different means and methods to try to reach the hardened heart of the people of his day. And the first message that he gave was a message to a people who had returned and who had not been blessed, but each one was had moved out in a little subdivision and built his own little home, and he was satisfied not to do anything about rebuilding God's temple. And this is the way Haggai begins. And it's a, he begins with a challenge. It's an appeal, if you please, to the heart. Will you listen to him? Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. They had returned. They had not been prosperous. God tells them his judgment was still upon them. And yet they had been able to rebuild their own homes, and they were willing to go along their way and when they were reproached because they had done nothing about rebuilding God's house, their answer was this, well, you know, it's not the Lord's time to rebuild the temple. It's not the Lord's time. How many Christians today hide back of that? 
I don't think it's the Lord's will for me to do something. I know that we had a couple here for quite a while. They're not with us anymore. They, for several years, they were going to the mission field, but they never got there because it was never quite the Lord's will for them to go right there and then. How many Christians tonight are like that? Something's come up that's hard and difficult, and it's not quite the time to do this. And they hide back of that. And that's what these people were saying. Oh, they were pious about it. Oh, they would have told you, we want to do the Lord's will, but we don't think it's the Lord's will for us right now to rebuild. We don't feel that the time has come to rebuild God's house. You want to know whether it was God's will or not? Will you listen to him as he speaks to them? The people say the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie away? You see, these people had gone out into the suburban areas and built them little lovely Southern California bungalows. But when the temple was to be rebuilt, they didn't think that should be done. Oh, how up-to-date human nature is. How many times have we already heard that in this remodeling program? I listened to a man the other day, a member of this church, just built him a new home, but he didn't think we should remodel. The rascal was willing to live in a new home himself, but he didn't want a new home for God. <laughs> How many people are like that today? It's not time to do anything for God, but it's time for me to do something for myself. Oh, how unpopular Haggai was to go out and visit into the new homes of these people and say to them, you're saying it's not time to build God's house. Well, how is it time for you to move into a new house? May I say to you that Haggai was not elected the man of the year for Jerusalem Chamber of Commerce that year. He was too personal. He's uh, speaking to them about their ways. And he gives them a challenge, a challenge from God, and it's appeal to their heart. And when the Scripture appeals to the heart, that means the total personality. All a man. An outstanding preacher in America was speaking in a seminary in the East, and the students were handing in questions, and one student says to him, when you preach, what do you preach to, a man's will, his intellect, or his heart? And the man gave this answer. He says, I preach to the 15 inches of air right in front of my mouth. That's what I preach to. May I say that that's a good answer because the Word of God appeals to the total personality. And this is an appeal, it's a challenge to them. God says to them, here, consider your ways. Is it time for you to dwell in your own sealed houses and not do something for God? It's so easy today to hide back of some pious, measure no line and say, well, it's not time for me to do something for God. My friend, when is it going to be time for you to do something for God? When is it going to be time for you to take a stand for God? When is it going to be time for you to get into the will of God? When is it going to be time for you to do the work of God? How pious that sounds. God says, it's my will for you to begin right now. 
And no man can say, I'm waiting tonight for God's will. It's not time for me to move out. I must wait, you know. He says, it's time to do something for God. That is the first. The second is a call to consideration, and it's an appeal to the mind, if you please. Will you listen to him? Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go back and look at your life and see if God now has blessed you. And here's what he says to them. Look at your life, and when you look at your life, what do you see? Ye have sown much, and you bring in little. Ye eat, but you do not have enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. He that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Consider your ways. Now you see how practical Haggai is. It's one of the most practical books in the Bible. You know, friends, this business of the way of God and the Word of God and the will of God in our lives is not something way up yonder in the air. It's not something that's idealistic. It's not something that's far-fetched. It's something that's quite real that can put on work clothes Monday morning and go to work and be right in the center of the will of God, can be doing the work of God, whether it's in the office, whether it's in the schoolroom, whether it's in the workshop. It doesn't make any difference where you are. In the kitchen washing dishes, you can be in the very center of the will of God. This business today that the will of God and the work of God is something that's way off up yonder. And we have to be preaching or even going as a missionary or even singing. Why, you can wash dishes to the glory of God and you can dig a ditch to the glory of God if he's called you to do that sort of thing. And my friend tonight, all you have to do is to consider your way. Look back over the past week in your own life and heart. Has there been satisfaction in what you've done? Has there been joy in what you've done? Have you this past week, can you look back and say, oh, you may be prosperous and have money in your pocket tonight. That today is not the measure. It was in the Old Testament. It's not today. But tonight can you count your spiritual blessings and look back and say this past week, I have been blessed. If not, then God says, consider your ways. You may be going the wrong way. You may be out of his will. How many Christians tonight are willing to go along like this, being beggars spiritually, not satisfied? just hanging on. My friend, this happens to be very practical. Consider your way. Look back over your past life. What do you see? Do you feel tonight that you are in the center of the will of God? Are you rejoicing tonight in him? Or do you look back and there's regret? Do you look back and that bag in which you were gathering so much, maybe not of money, but you were gathering things that you thought were so valuable and all those things have slipped from you? I stood the other afternoon up in the San Joaquin Valley with a man that I suppose he's worth a quarter of a million dollars. He and I had been quail hunting out in one of his ranches. And we came back to the car. And I just looked out over there and and just said, not maybe even speaking to him, and I said, my God is so good. 
He came around, tears were coming down his eyes. He said, Brother McGee, let's pray. And I said, fine. And he and I stood out there, sun was going down. And I listened to that man pray as he thanked God for all of his blessings, all that God had done for him. And then after we had concluded and got in the car, he said to me, he said, you know, all that I've gathered, I don't count it worth anything, of no value whatsoever. He said, the thing that today is valuable in my life is the fact that my children are in God's service. The thing that I rejoice in is my spiritual blessing. And he says, I thank God that I put first things first. Wonderful to listen to an old man talk like that. He showed me the ranch. He said, went by there. He said, during the Depression, I lost everything. I went out in that orchard. I got down on my knees, and I said to God, if you'll bless me, I'll give you everything. And he said, you know, it's been wonderful from that day to this. And that night and the next morning when I drove home, I had oh, such a wonderful, wonderful feeling to have been with a man, because there's so few like that today that can look back upon a life without regrets, look back upon a life, and all it is is a bag with holes in it and everything is run out. How many men are like that tonight? How many women are like that tonight? God says, consider your way. It's very practical, very real. He appeals to your mind. Go back and think this thing over. Where have you put him in your life? Now will you notice, we have a command, an appeal to the will. For God calls to man, will you listen to him now? Verse 8, verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the mountain, and bring wood, and build a house. There is, without doubt, the most prosaic sermon that was ever given. I want to tell Haggai that he would not last five weeks in Southern California if he came up with sermons like that. Imagine just getting up with people. He's got three points. That's good. But all that he says is this. He says, go up to the mountain. That's point number one. Go up to the mountain. Two, bring wood. Three, and build a house. That certainly isn't poetic, is it? But you know that I'm not sure but what we need more of that in our Christian living today. Something that's geared to the kitchen and the classroom and the office and the workshop. This man, Haggai, says to these people, you are saying it's not time to build God's house. God says it is time. And there are three things that you are to do. Not difficult. Go up. Bring wood. Build a house. That's all. Sermon's over. Let's have the benediction and let's all of us get busy. That's what it means. Oh, there's so much today that's not geared into our living, if you please. And that's what he's saying here. These are the requirements. These are the requirements. Three things that you're to do. And the reason is this. Will you notice it? I'll take pleasure in it. I will be glorified. He says that the reason that you're to rebuild God's house is because God says, I'll take pleasure in it, and second, I'll be glorified. And my beloved, 
that's the thing that should be the gauge for all of our endeavor. Tomorrow, when you go to the office, tomorrow when you go to the workshop, tomorrow when you go to school, what are your reasons, what's your motives, what are you after? Are you attempting to live so that tomorrow God can take pleasure in what you're doing? Will he be glorified tomorrow in your life? You don't have to go as a missionary for God to be glorified in your life. He can be glorified in the workshop. If you're doing what he wants you to do, if that's his will for you, this is practical. This is something that you gear to the life, my beloved. This is something that walks in shoe leather on the streets of Los Angeles. God says, I'll take pleasure in it. I'll be glorified when you rebuild my house. And my friend, whatever you are doing, this is the, these are the reasons. And then listen. He gives them the reasoning. He's appealing, as you can see here now, not only to their mind, but he's appealing to their will. Ye look for much, and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that's waste, and you run every man unto his own house. You look for much, it came to little. He brought it home, and I did blow upon it. Why did I do it? Well, because you were neglecting the thing I had called you to do and brought you back to that land. My house lieth waste. And you run every man to his own house. How wonderful it would be if Christians, not just on Sunday, but every day of the week, would put God first in everything that they do. God says, I can't bless you. I don't mean now materially. I can't bless you unless you do that. This is very practical, very real. We're dealing with God now in reality. You can't fudge with him. You can't put up a front with him. My friend, you have to be real with him. Are you putting him first in your life? Then if you are, God says, I'll bless you. But if you're not, I won't bless you. Isn't that reasonable? Isn't that practical? Isn't that workable, my beloved? Now will you notice, God says here, it's been because of you that I've withheld the rain from heaven. It's because of you that the fruit has not come from the ground. And God says, I call for a drought upon all of it. It was my judgment upon you. Because of the fact you had despised my word, you had gone my way. Now, I'd like to get as much of this on the air tonight as possible. Will you notice this in closing? Obviously, the word of God and the way of man is in conflict. Man contradicts God and God condemns man's ways. And they're like one of these freeways, if you please, like these divided highways today. On one side, God's going one way. On the other side, man's going the other way. And God says to man, and he speaks now of the human family tonight, they are all gone out of the way. God says, consider your ways. God says of the human family that you in our natural estate, we're going our way. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his 
own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all, his own way. And that's the trouble tonight with the human family is we've gone his own way. God says, consider your way. Your ways are not my ways, saith the Lord. Neither are your thoughts my thoughts. My ways are high above you. The heavens are above the earth, and so are my thoughts above your thoughts. God says, man's way is a way that leadeth to destruction. And now God sends out the appeal, let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord. God says, leave your way, and hear my word, and he that'll hear my word shall live. He speaks of it as even being a way of life. He says the way of the transgressor is hard. And Jeremiah says, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. And our Lord said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And then he says, I'm the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And Isaiah gives the invitation, this is the way, walk ye in it. Man's way is going one direction. It's away from God. It leads to death. It leads to a lost eternity. And God says to man, consider your ways. Turn. Listen to my word. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And the Lord Jesus Christ says you're going the wrong way. Consider your ways. Turn now. Listen to my word. Follow my direction. I'm the way. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. He made a dead-end street out of every other way. He said every cult in Southern California is wrong. I didn't say it. He said it. He said, I'm the way to God. And he says, Anna, in this way, I'm the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. God says to you tonight, consider your way. Shall we pray? With our heads bowed tonight in this closing moment, and the service will not be over for a few moments, we trust that you'll stay till the benediction. We won't be here very long. I'm wondering if you were here tonight, friend, and you've been going your way. You may have thought it was right. God says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man. But God says man's way leads to death. The way that seemeth right unto man, it leads to death and to destruction and a lost eternity. God says, listen to my word. Hear my word. Come unto me. I'm the door. I'm the way. Come this way. And it's just that simple that you'll hear his way. And if tonight you're a child of God, you're out of the will of God, you're not listening to the word of God, therefore not going the way of God, 
There's no satisfaction in your heart. You don't have to tell me that. I know something about it. I tried that. Won't work. God says to you, consider your way. Oh, tonight, friend, consider your way.